truly believe in the magic. What's up, Magic fans? Welcome to Penny for Your Thoughts. Today is Saturday, the 18th of June, and this is episode 85. Uh, I'm joined by Gary and Mikey. Um, Gary's standing in for Paul, who's unwell, so send our best wishes to him. Um, so how are we, guys? Mikey, you good, mate? Yeah, man, I'm good. Uh, I heard from Paul about an hour ago, and he sounds like Batman one minute. And uh, very high pitch next time. Like, All right, Mikey, and then he's talking really high like this. If you if you, uh, if you want a conversation with Paul this afternoon, but he's coughing his guts up, bless him. But uh, yeah, I'm good, mate. I'm good. Thank you. Excellent, good stuff. And uh, off the bench again, he comes, off Gary. Oh, sick man. Fair play. He is. He is an absolute diamond. I like uh, you know, the Carol Armstrong of the uh, of the pod. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, man. Six man of the year. You, yes. uh, do you have a good week, mate? Always, mate. It's always good to be on here. I'm just disappointed I didn't get a call off Paul either because when I had the look, he was all about my sexy phlegm voice and I kind of wanted to get it. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a very important week coming up. Um, we've got the, the draft. So we d- we are delighted to be joined by Mr. Stuart Hodge, a.k.a. Hodgey the Hack. How are we, Stu? I know too bad, lads. As you say, it's an important week for the Magic coming up, uh, and I have been very much looking forward to coming on this podcast at some point, so it's good to join you all. And I was just actually trying to rack my brain there with what Batman character I would be. Definitely a villain. Um, <laughs> I don't know, the Riddler? Like, nobody can decipher what I'm writing and when I'm doing stuff, so I may be the Riddler. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good stuff, good stuff. So we'll we'll get to, to know Stuart a little bit more when we just get to the guest section. So as we do every week, we'll just uh, go through a bit of NBA slash magic news. Um, so as I'm sure we all were, we were all delighted on uh, Friday morning to learn that the Golden State Warriors concluded the NBA season by beating the Boston Celtics 4-2. Uh, any thoughts, gentlemen? On um, on the finals, let's go to Stuart first because I know Stuart's been covering it for uh, for, for our Sky. friends at Sky Sports. Yeah, uh, I mean Stephen Cut Stephen Curry. I can't even speak. Stephen Curry is an artist. Like he is. I mean, I, I might be. I might offend the entire Orlando Magic community uh, here, but he is my favorite basketball player of all time. Yeah, he is. He's not. I'm not saying he's the best. I'm not saying he's the goal. I hate those debates, right? See, with those debates, I think basketball goes in eras, right? And what you could do now, you could make an argument that this is the Yanis era because he's the most dominant player on both ends. But Stephen Curry is my favorite basketball player to watch. Like, I, I just think the guy is magnificent. And what you usually find in the heat of the playoffs is the the team with the best player usually more often than not wins. And I think the the Boston Celtics, it was a victory for a really, really good team culture, culture that's been built there. Amy Odoka has been fantastic uh, in, in terms of what he's done with that young ball club. But Jason Tatum, for all that we've heard that Jason Tatum's this great player and obviously announced himself onto the scene with that dunk over LeBron in his, in his rookie year, and yeah, he's developed and he's, he's he's pushed on as a player and the Boston Celtics have a great defence collectively. But Jason Tatum is not the guy yet as 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 far as it looks. And I think that was that was the big difference in the series. When the chips were down for the Golden State Warriors, they could rely on Steph Curry to create offense and and be a magician. And the the Celtics were relying on the collective rather than being able to 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 have an individual that could produce that something special. Uh, but yeah, the better team won, and uh, I mean, I, I I I don't mind that Warriors dynasty at all. So I'm quite happy, and I know you're definitely probably happy with the result. Get, get out. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's just that they they all bang on about banner number eighteen, don't they? And it's like, oh, just give it a rest. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Mikey, any thoughts on it? Uh, May I'm, I'm the same with you. It's just nice to see uh, Boston. Get their comeuppance, really. Their fans deserve it. Um, yeah, it's been. It was a good series, actually. I really, I really enjoyed. It. I think game five. I was talking to Paul quickly earlier about this. I think game five got a little bit boring. Um, Steph wasn't probably because Steph wasn't performing and That's shooting exactly the ball like it. he normally is. But um, 
No, I think it was a really good series. Um, the Warriors thoroughly deserve to win it. Boston had a great season. Uh, we won't take that away from them. Um, I think they sort of uh, it, uh, surprised quite a few of us. Um, so now we can look forward to the draft. We don't have to talk about the Boston Celtics anymore. <laughs> Quick one, guys. Like, do, on. do you think, like, I mean, I think if the Heat had got through, it would have been so, so drab and boring. So I'm glad the yeah. Celtics prevailed in getting out the East. But Chris Middleton doesn't get hurt, then do we it's have a, a much better diff- finals? Because Giannis against yeah. the 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 war like Stefan the Warriors, like, I mean, that that would be the finals probably you would have wanted on paper, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you think so? Uh, and Gary, any thoughts on the Celtics booing their ho- own home team uh, at, at the half? Surprising, but I thought, to be honest, the Celtics at the start of the season, I had them as a playing team. So I think okay. the leap that they'd taken, um, like post All Star break, to where they've got to with or without Middleton, was absolutely um, immense. But the way I looked at it, it was it was a really nice uh, appetizer. And we've got the main event with the NBA draft. (laughs) 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 Select there, number one. Absolutely. And as you say, uh, the, you know, attention shifts to Orlando now. uh, And we know the Magic staff are hard at work, you know, preparing for next Thursday. Um, So just a bit of a recap on some of the players that may be available to us, or they will be available, seems your first pick. Um, Chet Holmgren worked out for the Magic this week and it's reported uh, he did two days with the team. So that was, I think, Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, We also found out that Shaden Sharp claims he's worked out for the Magic in recent days. Uh, However, I think uh, that'd be a bit of a stretch taking him first. Uh, and the latest was uh, Paolo Banchero uh, is he's due to work out with us in the coming days uh, and that was reported by Tim Reynolds of the Associated Press um, so let's just quickly oh, one thing we haven't done actually boys a couple of weeks ago we had a, a poll put up didn't we for uh, player of the season etc and it dawned on me when I was preparing for this podcast we haven't announced the results on the pod might have seen it on Twitter, etc. So I'll just quickly run through the results, just so everybody's uh, aware. So we had uh, Player of the Season, uh, and that was won by Franz Wagner with 73%. Wendell Carter team second with 23 and Cole got 4%. I think that might have been Gary. Was that you, Gar? I couldn't possibly comment. You know, when you go to, it's secret voting, lads. We know this. It's secret voting. <laughs> <laughs> it's your bur- it's your burner account, mate, wasn't it? My burner account. <laughs> you and your burner what, account. What are you talking about? I might have cast a vote from the Orlando Magic. UK. <laughs> 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 uh, the second category was unsung hero. Uh, probably no surprises here. Mo Wagner with seventy five percent of the vote. Gary Harris coming in second, nineteen. Admiral Schofield with four, and Devin Kennedy with two. Uh, and lastly, oh, I was, like that. I like some love for Kennedy, man. Like that's good. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. I think he's got a, a place in uh, Orlando fans' hearts, doesn't he? Uh, and we hope to see him again this definitely. season coming up. So uh, yeah, uh, and the last one then was moment of the season. Uh, this was won by Markel Fultz returning. Um, you know, when the team showing all the love to him, etc. With forty nine percent. Second was beating the Knicks and the whole Bing Bong thing. 26. Yes. Um, then we had uh, Jalen Suggs' dunk on DeMar DeRozan and a beatdown of the Chicago Bulls. And um, the announcer getting a little bit cross. Um, and then the last thing was beating Golden State, the champion. So uh, there we have it. There's one more thing to throw in there, G, before we carry on. Uh, the on, Magic mate. this afternoon tweeted, what if we said you could only pick one? And they've posted six pictures of all the different logos that the Magic have had since day one, including the OG logos. So if you're watching this podcast and you haven't gone on Twitter and replied to the Magic, make sure you do. It's either a teaser just to go... Oh, well, if you like the old logos, well, we're going to make you stick with the rubbish that we've got at the moment. <laughs> mm-hmm. Or or there's something to it where they're actually listening to fans' voices on what sort of logo and 
jerseys and all that sort of stuff that we want to move forward with because I think we can all agree the original logos are the best yeah I was just going to say do you want to go do you want to go around the houses and everyone say which logo is their favourite yeah no. yeah go on I'll go to Stuart first I, I like the 09 era stuff like I thought we looked really good like the core and like everything just looked great at that kind of point um, I mean Part of the thing for me is maybe age comes into it, not to not to put any of you guys in the spot yeah. in, in terms of things. But I I mean, I'm too young really to remember like watching Shaq and Penny and stuff like that. What I do know, um, talking of Shaq, by the way, I, I'm at my girlfriend's at the moment and I had no uh, Orlando Magic memorabilia. So he mentions, Biggie Smalls mentions Shaq and Gimme the Loop. So the best I could do was borrowing uh, a Biggie Smalls T-shirt of my girlfriend. That's as tenuous <laughs> as my um, magic apparel gets tonight. Uh, but yeah, like I, I think, I mean, that said, the reason I'm an Orlando Magic fan, which he's probably would quite like to know, is NBA Live 95 and the Mega Drive, right? Little Rain Man Me went cycling through all the menus and the centres were listed at the top of uh, like the, the positions in terms of when you were picking teams best centre in the game, Shaquille O'Neal. Uh, and also, I remember, even on that uh, sort of 16-bit console, the, the the court floor that the Magic had was different. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was different from any other. So yeah. that made me, like, even more sort of justified in my choice. And that's the things you noticed. Is, like, I was born in 1989, so I was, like, six, seven, whatever, when I was playing the game. And that was that. Was that. But um, yeah, like I mean, I, I can remember roundabouts or all nine and stuff, and I, I just I really like the feel around the team at that time, and I think I think that's the way that these kind of things sort of go with you. It's like it's, you, you gravitate to the nostalgia of what you enjoyed at the time, so that's that's why I would go with that. Oh, and you go, yeah, oh, brilliant! Uh, no surprises here. The OG Shaq era ones for me all day. Get them back. Yeah, I'll just and one that one. Got to, got to bring that back. What do you mean? It's this is the way. This Indeed. is the way. The Mandalorian. <laughs> Chuck, you got to throw one of those quotes in there, aren't you? Uh, no, for me, my fa- G knows this. My favorite is the uh, T Mac era with the more cartoony look, but that's just my nostalgia because that's what I grew up with. But yeah. I still think the original logos are the best. That's uh, that's my yeah. opinion. And the way it was having a look at some of the replies, it was the OG one that was winning by yeah. a long way. So hopefully they listen to us. But there we go. Right. Um, just a quick one. NBA draft watch party. Um, so this Thursday, uh, please join us for the 2002 NBA draft. Uh, so that's Thursday night, Friday morning. 2002? Um, 2022. Oh my god! Are, are you like Ron Burgundy? At the moment, on the auto queue, you read it exactly <laughs> as it is. Well, I, I misread it then, didn't I? I hope, I hope there's no messages coming up there about Boston G, or you'll really be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Um, so, uh, as I was saying, uh, we'll be hosting a live watch party on Zoom to see who the Orlando Magic select the first overall puck, uh, pick. If you would like to join us, please visit orlandomagicuk.com forward slash events. Fill in the sign-up form and we'll send you a link uh, to the Zoom uh, uh, Zoom what is it? Room, whatever you want to call it, on the day of the draft. And you can find all the links in the description <laughs> of the podcast. I'm having a moment, aren't I? Anyway, right then. Let's get to know Mr. Stuart Hodge a little bit more. So as we've uh, touched upon, he is the digital content creator for Sky Sports. He's also a commentator, an announcer, a writer, a pundit. Gosh, this is a list, isn't it? And um, doing such work as covering Norwich City uh, and English football in general. So that, that includes that includes the Welsh teams, mate. Um, oh yeah, as you know, yeah, commented in a few Kiefer Moore goals uh, in recent times. Yeah, I, I mean, football's kind of commentate. The announcer thing, right? That's basically me kind of g- giving a bit of leeway in terms of my job description with the idea that if I said I was a commentator to an American, they'd be like, 
like, that means something different to like, oh, you mean you're the announcer? And I'm like, yeah, well, yeah, well, like <laughs> I announce, I announce goals. Um, but yeah, like in terms of, like, I've, I've never done live basketball commentary. That's one thing that I'm, I'm hoping that I can do in my career. But um, I mean, I, I'm a fan of many commentators. David Steele with the Magic is 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 brilliant, man. Like I, I love the Magic's broadcast team. I've got a lot of lot of love for them. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I've been doing the job at Sky. I've been working on and off for Sky as a freelancer for about four years, ever since they got the NBA rights. I've been the main sort of relief man. Then at the start of the year, I, I started doing the job basically as a kind of standard five days a week kind of job. That turned into a, a six-month fixed-term contract. And we'll, we'll, we'll see where that, that obviously leads from, from there. Uh, but yeah, always been a freelancer across loads of sports. Done everything from writing about like quantum computing to writing about the Golden State Warriors the other night and Stephen Curry and whatever. Uh, writing about football, uh, commentating football, uh, doing news reading about ski jumping on Eurosport. I've probably done it. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, the one thing I don't do is video editing because I'm no good at it. And it's such a such a skill, as you guys might know, if you the kind of wee bits and balls you do. And like, I mean, jack of all trades becomes like eventually just master of none. So uh, when it came to like, learning how to shoot with a camera and video edit, that was where I drew the line. I was like, nah, that's not for me. Uh, you do a superb job, mate. And of course, you've got your, your thing with Norwich City, Hodge on Nodge. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, as soon as I get the Sky job, I don't have time to do it. I've, I've done one podcast in three months which you guys with your regular great content going out must be going come on Hodgie that's not good enough <laughs> um, and I do agree but the other thing is Norwich City was so dreadfully awful and this is the bit where I've got to stop myself swearing like <laughs> I honestly man like I mean one, it was affecting the amount of people. People just weren't interested in like the content. But that's not your fault. It's the team's fault. So why put out content when nobody's interested in it and when you're just going to be like you and the other person are going to be like those two Muffets, Stadler and Waldorf, is it? Like just at the balcony moaning about everything. So I <laughs> thought, nah. But then um, there was news about like a potential takeover for the guy that owns the Milwaukee Brewers. So I did. Um, I, I jumped on to do an episode about that. Which which seems to have gone down well, but yeah, um, look, under my Hodgie the Hack, H O D G E Y the Hack, all one word, um, under that kind of branding across all social media and on my YouTube channel, I, I do the Norwich Pod, and then I've got a few other things that I'm kind of working on. That depending on what happens with Sky moving forward, that's maybe what I'm probably going to be focusing on is my my personal content come uh, the new basketball season and stuff. So. That's that's no, where my good. focus is going to be. But that said, it's been an amazing six months doing the Sky stuff, and hopefully, I've done done some work which which some of the fans on here have enjoyed, or some of the listeners have enjoyed. Yeah, where does that where stuff. does that come from, Hodgie? Hodgie the hack. Where does that come from? Oh, right. So I made an email address. So, like, you know that journalists are called hacks, right? Um, because yeah. anyone American listening to this contrast will be yeah. like, uh, podcast will be like, why, why is this dude calling himself a hack? Like, the reason <laughs> is, uh, well, one, I'm a hack. And two, um, so it's, it's, it's a word you use for a journalist. Like, it's kind of, it's one of those, it's kind of, you use it as a kind of jokey term, but, like, it's also like, I suppose jargon or whatever that you could use that's applicable. But I made an email address back in like when I was in my first year of uni, 2009, like Hodgie the Hack at Goomail.com, thinking I was funny, you know, like 19 years old, thinking <laughs> everything I do is great. Uh, <laughs> so I made this email address and then I remember I applied for a work placement at Watford Football Club. And uh, it was a there was a geezer, kind of geezer type that was running. It. He's like, "Oh, Roger, yeah, 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 I'll get you for a week, mate. I love your email address, by the way." And I was like, "Oh, okay." Um, so it wasn't actually like a lot of the best things in life. It, I, I think it's quite suitable for because like, I mean, even though like, I try to do my journalism to the best of my ability, I'm not someone that takes myself overly seriously, and I think Hodgie the Hack kind of reflects that. So even though it happened by accident, when I was starting and thinking about putting out, obviously my Twitter handle became that just because, um, I mean, there's alliteration as well, Hodgie Hack. So uh, 
I, I, I think it's quite quite in keeping with the kind of dude that I am. And um, that was why I just made it the kind of umbrella term for all of my, my content and all of my socials and stuff. All right, good stuff. And before we just go into a bit more magic, obviously you'll be in the championship with uh, Gary Sunderland and Mike Cardiff next year. So uh, yes. I think I think eyes will be on the championship more than the premiership, Mikey. <laughs> hey, Alex Neil. <laughs> Well, I on that note, I've got um, I did the the one interview that Alec Neil has done about his time at Norwich City. It's a good two and a half hour long podcast. So if you've not checked that out, Gary, you might enjoy it. Episode one of Hodge on Notch. Very cool, oh, nice, good stuff, good stuff. Um, so you've touched upon it, your magic fandom. So it started with NBA Live '95, and I think the Magic Court was on the front of that box as well because I've got it as well. Don't in a yep. box somewhere in, in, in the attic or whatever um, so tell us about you know your favourite players favourite moments uh, and any games you've been to I've never been to a game I've never been to the United States never okay. yeah. I've got a plan to go there me, me and my girlfriend are looking at travelling around the States and that probably that's probably a life update that's uh, that, that I maybe shouldn't be giving you but um, aye, there's, <laughs> we've got a plan to go there uh, and obviously, obviously, right? My family keep trying to plan a Disneyland holiday, right? And I'm saying, right, it needs to be within the weeks of October, and like I would love to say June, October, and, and April, and they're like, well, that's no the summer. Why would you want to go then? And I'm like, no, because I'm no going for Disneyland, mate. Like <laughs> I want it to be during a homestand. You know what I mean? That's what I want. Um, to just pack myself into the army as many times as I possibly can. But uh, so never been to any games. Um, favorite moments. Uh, first favorite moment I can remember was like like just basically just the career of Hedo Turkoglu. Like I just loved that guy. Like he was, and I th- I don't know if it was maybe like the European thing maybe factored into it. I think. Um, and then that led to me as I got into the kind of contemporary stuff that was happening. Looking back. At, uh, Sort of the like the magic kind of glory days in the in the nineties as well, um, so enjoyed that. And then then more recently, like ah, uh, so I'm I'm really big on on Jonathan Isaac and what he was doing in the bubble. Like just gave us a snapshot of what what he maybe could be. And I think I said just prior to coming on, like coming on air in the pod, like I think we're forty wins next year. I do, and I think we're minimum thirty five. And if Jonathan Isaac can come in and be the dominant defensive force that like he is, and if he if he can keep his health, then that forty wins is ticking upwards a bit. As like even if the team is lacking a bit of experience and all the rest of it, and I maybe don't want us to get too many because I would like us to get another good solid pick next year. But if we can begin to build a culture, then that would be that 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 would be the main thing for me. Um, other kind of big moments are. Uh, I mean that dunk contest I was so the first one you know the one that Dwayne Wade ruined right um, like that first dunk contest like I, I was I was a really really big Aaron Gordon fan and I I, I still kind of like him but I mean did he really need to go in the way he did after he got traded you know what I mean because Fournier and stuff like you're like I mean Fournier was obviously limited and he he put a ceiling on what the team could do but he like he left and I thought he conducted his cell quite well. Whereas yeah. Gordon just did that kind of big time Charlie bit and it really annoyed me. Um but I did I did love Aaron Gordon and I was so excited in him. Like see when we when we drafted him and Alfred Payton, like I was really, really excited at that time. And that was why uh like last year I was kind of tempering my expectations because I thought we've been here before. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, like I must admit, I think the I think the front office so far they're on the cusp of making franchise era defining decision. Uh, but so far, I think the, the the current front office have done magnificently well for the Magic. Even the 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 three years of kind of standing pat, but then when they decided to blow up the value, I mean, look at the value of that Chicago Bulls trade ban, mm-hmm. crazy, fleeced them. Absolutely fleeced them, and yeah, I, I'm I'm really excited to see where we go with it, what we do with it. Um, and I'm going to throw it back to you guys. Sorry, sorry if I'm kind of interrupting the general. Do no, not at all. Um, I 
who who do you want and who do you think we're going to go for? Well, we've, we've got that part coming up. So, we'll, we'll, wait, uh, we'll, we'll wait for that because like, we'll, we'll, I'm just... I'm we'll, really build up to it. we'll build right. up to that, Stu. So, um, but, but before you move on, you, you brought up uh, Hido Turkoglu, Hodgie. Have you uh, guys seen the clip of JJ Reddick's podcast this week, Grant Hill? And no. uh, one of his rookie hazing, one of his rookie hazing, they basically duct taped him to a chair. And uh, before they wheeled him out to the court and duct taped it to the stanchion, Hedo, I think they put him in the showers and turned the shower on with him duct taped. And then Hedo <laughs> turns around and goes, should we all pee on him? <laughs> it's just a classic Hedo story. So if you want to watch any of all that, go uh, check out JJ's podcast. But uh, that is I love classic JJ Hedo. Reading, by the way. And I think, yeah, I, do. Best, I think he's one of the best pundits kicking about right now. He's like, yeah. he's so, so incisive. And they keep putting him on with Stephen A. I mean, give him a, give him a challenge, man. You know what I mean? Correct. Absolutely. So we just mentioned the draft there and you were talking about, um, you know, franchise altering decisions. What's your uh, impressions of the projected top three picks? Oh, mate. I'd like, do you know what? I was resolutely Chet Holmgren for a good two, three months, right? Like for if, if we got the chance, right? And then we got the number one pick and I'm like, yeah, got to be Chet. Got to be Chet. I'd be cheap. and I knew I would do this right I don't want Powell I like I mean I think he's a great player mm. I think he will be a great player I think he's the the most likely to step into the league and be impactful right away and I think he is probably the one that I would hang my hat on being an all-star if I was to say a certainty out of all three of them but Chet's like a unicorn among unicorns, man. Like he's a unicorn with two horns. Like, I don't know what you'd call that. Uh, a a dual corn. He's a dual corn, Chet Holmgren. And I... I, I, I Stu, 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 don't stop you there. Isn't that the national uh, animal of Scotland, the unicorn? It is indeed, mate. Good knowledge. <laughs> um, it's only because you told us before the pod uh, started. <laughs> no, um, I, like, uh, do you know what? Porzingis is looking like such a limited player now as well. Like, I mean, the fact that he couldn't make it work with Luca, when, I mean, like, guy that can block and many be able to space the floor, you would think that's the ideal kind of big to build a team we look around about. And he's going to the Wizards and I think he's going to have a pretty mediocre NBA career now. Um, but yeah, like I think Chet's got that something magical and I think in terms of upside, he is like, it's mind-blowing to think and especially within this magic system. But if I'm going team fit, I'm going Jabari because I think shooting from the wings and he's got the height, he's got a bit of defence, like, I love, I love the, I love his shot action, shot creation. I think, I think he's the one that I would say would be the best team fit. But you don't draft for team fit with the number one pick. You draft for what the player can become. And defensively, I think Chet looked brilliant. I think he looks like he's got. I think he looks like he's got an arsenal offensively, but it's almost like there's so much more to unlock there. And the big thing for me is right. I said for years that when it came to Mo Bamba, Steve Clifford was the problem. And we have seen that. We have seen that play out in front of us now that that is very much the case. Mo's future looks murky now, especially if we if we do draft Chet, then you wonder what that is. Maybe Mo's future is just as an impactful big from the bench for someone, whether it be us or, or, or whoever. But I think... I think the the way that we we develop players with Jamal like running things now, I think you saw the development of the team this year. Like it wasn't like the team just came in and and was immediately brilliant. The the one thing against that you maybe point to is Jalen Suggs still wasn't shooting the ball right. But a, another big factor in the Magic next season will be if Suggs can fix his shot to to the flashes of what we've seen in college, then. I mean, what player he's going to be? He's brilliant defensively. Superb. Look at the stats and they they play that out. And he's got hops, you know, and he's got a bit of tenacity there. And then I think that the thing that tips me over the edge to go for Chet is the Gonzaga connection. And that's where I think um, we're... 
where we haven't talked. I think the, the Gonzaga Bulldogs connection is just for me where I go. Do you know what? Like, if I had any doubts, I'm still, that's me shoving the chips in. And yeah, Chet Holmgren for me, although I don't I don't think we'll go Paolo and I wouldn't go Paolo, um, despite me, me saying that I think he's he's kind of the, the certainty of the of the three. Um, and I do think Jabari's the better immediate fit, but it's got to be Chet. That's where I'm at. Well, we'll, uh, we'll ask you again at the end of the pod because we know how quickly we all change our minds on who we're going to pick <laughs> <next>. <laughs> from, from one minute to the next. But moving on quickly to free agency, we'll, we'll go back to the draft in a minute. But what do you want to see the Magic do come free agency? So let's say they, they draft Chet. Do you want to see us re-sign Mo Bamba? Do you think it's time for us to move on from him regardless? It depends what the offer is, doesn't it? Like, because, but I, I think he'll have some suitors because he definitely, especially in the early stages of the season, I think he showed he could do the 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 three and the three and the the, the defensive blocking thing. But I think the problem with Mo is, I think, and I don't know the kid, right? Like, so I'm very much surmising as an outsider looking in. But I think it's just he's he seems quite a like a more timid personality. Than, yeah. than you would see for a lot of top basketball players. And and some some players with that character do go on and, and do great things in the game. But I think that's his problem. Because when you look at his phys, his physical stats, the fact he's, he's an intelligent guy, he's very cerebral. Um, there's no problem with teaching him stuff. But like sometimes he'll miss a basic box out and you think that's just because that competitive... <laughs> like... That, that's just feels, that's, it, it just feels like those natural instincts are lacking a little bit, doesn't it? Just reading the mm. game and watching watching plays develop. Well, I think there's a bit of that, but I also think like you can sometimes compensate for that with tenacity mm. and with um, just that that inner competitiveness. And I think I'm sure there's a competitive file there. You don't get to the NBA without it, but the what you need to be a modern big on paper he's got it all but there's a missing intangible that nobody can quite put their finger on so I think it depends on the offer but at the same time I don't think this is I don't think this is the time for the magic to to go all in on free agency um, unless there's someone they can get that would be an immediate franchise alterer um, Zach Levine um, <laughs> looking at you, uh, but again, I mean the magic at the moment. It's not it's not the market to get them. Whereas if we have one season where we look, we've got a young team like packed with potential, yeah. then you look at the free agency class or free agencies um, crop next year, and and that's where I think right. Do you know what? Maybe that's where we should be pinpointing. What about you guys? Go on, Gary. All right, okay. Um, I think this off-season, as you said, I don't think that's the time. Um, and I'm not quite sure. It would be really funny if we did sign Zach Levine because it basically means Chicago is going to be a lottery pick uh, next year. <laughs> so I think, it's, I think that it will be the ultimate like uh, demonic move to just go and say, we'll have Zach Levine <laughs> uh, consign Chicago to it. But I don't think the time's right because I don't think we know fully what we've got. Mm. There's a lot of questions around what the best backcourt combination is. We could, I know right now we would disagree on that if we threw it open, but um, we've also got to figure out really the front court because it looks like we're going to take a big one way or another on um, th- on Thursday. And then on top of that, it's the questions of where does France fit then? Where does Jonathan Isaac fit? Where does Wendell fit? So I think leaving it a year to see where all the pieces fall and then saying this is what we really lack will give us um, the best possible options. Signing somebody now might prove to be a long-term bad move to guarantee the first round of the playoffs again. Yeah, I'm absolutely with you there, Gar. Yeah. So add in a number one pick then, Stu. What sort of impact do you think that's going to give us next season? I know you said 40 wins is where you're thinking. What sort of improvement do you think it's going <laughs> to I'm gonna always have? an optimist. Um, I'm always an optimist, mate. I think, I mean, I think if you I think if you put Jabari in, then that prediction becomes a definite. But 
I want us to go check, which I think will might might put a lower ceiling in the wins because I think he's got longer he's got a longer development curve. Yeah. But I also think that I mean to be honest, I don't I don't think it matters all that much where the magic finish next year wins wise, as long as we see progression again. And it's about the progression amongst individuals and collectively. But what the the real thing that, that, that came through from last season and kept you up watching us get beat and, and blowouts and stuff was the team has 100% got that never say die attitude that even if we're down 20 points going into the last quarter, we'll, we'll maybe go on a run, you know, and, and close it. And we might lose by like seven or eight points, but it's like you see that they're, they're not taking any plays off even when the team's getting blown out. And I think culturally that, is a really really good sign for the magic. Um, I think I think if we I think if we add a number one pick, I, I, I don't I'm not really interested so much in how that moves the needle in terms of win numbers or anything like that. I'm interested in how it moves the needle in terms of the fit of the team and what the moves might be around the trade deadline next year to to see how we pivot going into the next draft and then going into the season after that because going into the the season after that is when I look at it and I think, right, I want us to be a playoff team. Because by that point, there's been long enough to develop. The big, there's a few huge what-ifs. Um, can Jalen Suggs find his shot? Can Jonathan Isaac stay healthy? If Jonathan Isaac can stay healthy next season and give us 70, 75 games um, next season, big if. But if, if that was to happen, then the Orlando Magic can make the play in definitely. Because I think he's that transformative a player on on the court, Markel Fultz. And another thing is, you look at Fultz and what he did in his time out, you know. Um, and and these guys, even though they're they're maybe not doing full contact or anything like that, but if Jonathan Isaac was to come back, stay healthy, and was to be like a three to five percent more accurate three point shooter, that moves the needle hugely for the Magic, mm. you know. And it's these small margins and areas where you can continue to, to keep keep developing even while you're injured because you can shoot the ball while you're injured. You know, you can work in the mechanics of your shot and do stuff like that. So it's the work that's been done in the background to develop. That's that's what I want to see. And I want to see how the individual players have increased that. And then bringing a number one pick into that, it's like, how do they amalgamate with the rest of the squad? Because there seems to be a really good culture. See, when you look at like clips yeah. and social media and stuff, they're having good fun, these guys together. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's just about seeing how the number one pick fits in and then the development curve, how quick that is and how much we adapt the style of play to accommodate whatever pick we go for. Um, because I think if you do pick Chet, I think you've maybe got to change it. And I'm interested to see the Chet Wendell fit. That's going to be great. Um, and the one thing that I'm praying for next season is I want I want to see I want to see the Orlando Magic healthy. Because I think the one thing that people would would sort of could maybe lobby at the team during this this front office's tenure is the the health of the players and therefore training staff whatever um, and I always think it's unfair to pick and training staff because they're obviously doing the job and and like it's it's in the lap of the gods sometimes fate wise what can happen in terms of injuries but I'd like to see a healthy a, a healthy year for the Magic because we all saw the stats in, in terms of number of games missed it was remarkable last year so um, even with COVID and and all of that presenting for everyone so yeah healthy year for the Magic is what I want and. I'm interested to see how the number one pick amalgamates and how we evolve as a as a squad and as a team with that. But yeah, not about number of wins, about development again. But this is the last of the development years. After that, we need to be we need to be something. Yeah. So if you became the GM this week, it sounds like it that's the be- dream. That's the dream, mate. Hey, it can happen. <laughs> um, sounds like would you be taking Chet? And are there any circumstances in which you would trade the pick? You, well, well, why? If you give, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, like there is, there is circumstances in which I would do that. And that is if you can get a really good first rounder next year from a team that you're, you're fairly sure is going to crater, um, <laughs> which is hard because like with the play in now as well, um, 
let, there's just there's a bit more incentive for teams not to tank, obviously, which is, is what the league wants. Um, and then the flattened draft odds obviously kind of change things as well. Um, which, by the way, I thought we were going to fall victim to because you know the <laughs> the magic lottery looks like. I just thought, yeah, we're we're going to be four at best. Like <laughs> I'd consigned myself to that uh, before the lottery, and then I like I just couldn't believe it. Especially when that thunder pick came out, I was like, <laughs> unbelievable. But um, yeah, I think if you get the if you get the right offer, you maybe you maybe add Jabari, and you think like maybe give Bamba another go or whatever. No, do you know what? Like I'm saying that, and I'm like, as <laughs> this just goes to show, my brain is constantly flitting. No, give me Chet. Like, right. and you need to you need to give me a king's ransom. For me, not to pick Chet Holmgren, to be honest. Two, two, two firsts at least. Talk that uh, Kevin O'Connor in the ringer has said that Houston really want to get into the top two, and they've got um, the twenty sixth, the seventeenth, and the third pick. Would that? How would you feel about that one? Give me two more first rounders, and then talk to me. Like, as as I say, next year's draft class is the one. Mm. You know, um, and good that we've already got two. Good, well, like potentially good picks, especially two brilliant picks with Zach Levine as well. Um, yeah, I, I mean, that, that would be really interesting, but I don't think for the magic, we don't need numerous pieces. We need the piece now, you know? Like, I think we've got a good young core. It's not about uh, getting getting that together. And Houston, I think, is in a similar situation, to be honest. That's a really interesting thing, though. That makes me think, that Paolo might be going top two if they think that. Because, I don't, well, maybe not. Maybe, maybe maybe they think it is Jabari and they want to put him next. Because obviously the reason they've traded Wood is to open up minutes for Sengun. Mm. So maybe they want some more shooting from that power forward position. We had a chat earlier, G, didn't we, about this? We did, we did. I think it's really interesting because... Bancaro, there's all of a sudden this talk that he, you know, like it's been quite hyped up that Bancaro's coming in in the next couple of days to talk to Orlando. There was, and please don't ask me to quote the pod, but there was a pod in the last 24 hours. So uh, one of the guests was saying, like, really locked on that Bancaro was the Magic's guy. And I'm looking at it going, this is a front office that leaks absolutely nothing. And then all of a sudden has the smoke and mirrors. Um, started to be played where we're saying making noises about Bancaro quite it's becoming quite well known he's coming in for a workout are we trying to put a bit of pressure on Houston here to say oh you know select Bancaro for us and we'll give and that means one of Chet or Jabari therefore is going to be number three and it takes that pressure off the magic of all the who you know like this is the number one guy and they've therefore got the pressure on them where there's no clear cut number one this year. Plus, you get the assets alongside it. I, I think I think there's something like I think there's um, possibly smoke and okay. coming out of our front office has perhaps started in the last 24 hours. I think. Mm. Well, interesting about Bancaro. I was with my brother last night, and uh, he's an Oklahoma fa- uh, fan, and uh, he was just filling me in on what the Oklahoma um, sort of um, media was saying. And it turns out Bancaro is from Seattle. He is. He does not like Oklahoma for what they did to move uh, the Sonics to the Thunder. He since retracted that and said, oh, you know, it'd be an honour to to be picked by them, et cetera, et cetera. But just, you know, just something to add to the mix there. You know, he might not want to stick around there, but it sounds to me like OKC won um, Chet. But, yeah. Um, yeah, we shall see how it pans out. Um, yeah, so last one, don't leak ever. Their front officer are exactly the same as ours. They don't leak anything either. No. Um, so last one, Stu. Tell me mm-hmm. who you think the best player is on the Magic and what's your starting five next year? Because there's a lot of going back and forth. What's the best backcourt? You know, Wagner's is the three. And then what's the, what's the front court look like? So what's your five for opening night next season given everybody's healthy yeah right <laughs> so are we, are we going with a draft well do you know what opening night 
Um, opening night, I'm not I'm not throwing him in. So Jonathan Isaac's healthy. I think he starts alongside Wendell Carter um, in the front court. Franz, obviously, then. And then, I mean, if you were doing it based on the season just gone, you would say Kel and Cole. But if Jalen Suggs shot, I mean, I, I know I keep saying it, but if if his shot is looking better, then I think based on, on what we've seen, I, I think you would have to go with that. I think you'd have to go Kel, Cole, Franz, um, then Wendell and J.I. But um, I'm really, that's what's so tantalising about the Magic right now, because you look, has Mo Bamba made more of a jump? Has um, Jalen Suggs made a jump? You're going to have a top draft pick in there. And there's there's so much talent around the squad and I think by the way um, bringing Mo Wagner in was a master stroke because I think it helped Franz obviously having your brother there but I think also I, I just love you know that way one of the great things about the NBA is when there's a player particularly like a role player and he just fits on one team you know like, he's never going to get a big contract. And, like, I mean, Mo Wagner could go and he could probably get, like, a big contract, or, well, like, semi-big, like, a, a decent-ish contract somewhere if he has another good year with the Magic, right? But he won't want to. Like, he's probably going to want to stay with his brother. And he's just the right player in the right role, and he's excelled there. And he's part of that culture. And that's the thing that encourages me most about the Magic is the culture around the team. So, yeah, I think... I think that's that. That's my big thing. Like, is is why I'm I'm looking forward to it so much. Then again, like, I mean, GI is maybe the one that you integrate more slowly, right? I'm making a change. GI's dropped. <laughs> Chet's starting. Chet and Wendell. <laughs> Chet, Chet and Wendell. Um, and yeah, just 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 for health reasons. But I think that starting five can become any number of things it's not like you're going to go into the season and it's going to stay the same I think as players forms fluctuate then it will change I also think Cole Anthony's ideal role is sixth man like I just mm. think that suits the I think it suits his, his energy the drive the kind of guy he is and like he'll probably get you know one of those six men that gets starter level minutes um, I think that's his role and if he can be that energy guy for the bench and provide that punch then whatever's in front of him is going to be tantalising to watch. But the Magic are going to be able to have decent contributions from in all areas of the court from decent people. We still need another shooting wing, regardless of who we draft. I always think that. Um, give me another shooting wing, and yeah, I'll be really, really happy with where we're at, to be honest. Um, but that, that'll be interesting to see around around free agency time, depending on who's available. But yeah, yeah. yeah. so aye, f- f- final, final team line in. Chet. Final um, answer. Like you're on Chet. who wants to be a millionaire? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Are you sure? No, we don't want to give you that. Um <laughs> <laughs> Wendell Carter, Chet Holmgren, Franz Wagner, um Cole Anthony and Mark Elfoots. When, awesome. Did you did you see uh, Gary's body language change when uh Hodgie said Cole should be a sick time and Gary's like Oh, I'm, to, I'm, gonna to, I'm gonna have to hold myself back here. No, 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 mate. Hit me, me with it. Hit me with it. Because, like, clearly I've blasphemed. Not at all. Uh, I think it's. I think it's a funny one with Cole because I think it's one of the most polarizing debates on Magic Twitter, and I know I've got into it before with people um, over Cole. And I just, I'm of the opinion right now that him and Markel have to be the backcourt because they were the two best performing guards that we had last season. Uh, Markel at the end, he's proven what he can unlock. And I think he needs a shooter alongside him. And whereas I think Cole's defence isn't where he would want it to be either until Jalen Suggs addresses the shot, putting him and Markel together in the backcourt would be a recipe for disaster. Whereas we've seen Cole can even over a 30-game sample, be that guy who can get the shots off. So I, I think that, for me, would be the combination um, until proven otherwise. I think Suggs has got to earn it. Um, I like a lot about Jalen Suggs's game. I think he's been incredibly unlucky um, because I think when he got the injury last season, he was on the verge of turning that corner. 
and then he got injured. But I think he's in the position where he's got to earn it right now for me. Um, and I think Fultz has definitely got the team built around him. So it's Cole's job to keep that spot. But like, if you're right, if he does become the sixth man, he'll become a sixth man like Clarkson where he gets 30 minutes a game because of what he can do scoring-wise. And it's interesting because I think if we go Jabari, um, I was watching a pod the other night. Uh, who was it? I think it was, they were saying about it, Jabari Smith, the way he runs the floor, he kind of trails the offence. And mm. Cole can go in, we know he can just take it in to the paint against whoever's there. And he said the way he trails, Jabari would actually make people cool off Cole because they wouldn't be able to leave him um, unmarked. So it could actually be that Jabari and Cole would be the better combo, just like Jalen Suggs and Chet. That's really interesting, actually. Yeah. Mm. It was a um, fun office guy who was saying it. I know, like, I think that's, I mean... I always take where we pinch us all these things like league executive said yeah. an unnamed league executive because they've got their own vested agenda mm-hmm. when they're saying these things anyway, you know. Um but I think I think like, that's not an example of that though. Like mm-hmm. to, just to add Gary, that's that's sounds like somebody just giving an opinion. But I I think the most interesting aspect, as you say, is gonna be watching what that starting lineup becomes come April ish. You know, like, how is that going to look? And especially if everyone's healthy, who who are going to be the best Magic players? And I think it's balancing... Oh, I mean, this is always the balance and has been the balance the Magic have been trying to strike for over a bloody decade. And it is um, upside current, upside current, like, what, what, are you, what are you leaning towards? What gives you... And I think come April, we want to be leaning into... What gives we hopefully we're in a position season wise to be leaning into what is going to be the best mm-hmm. for us right now, what is going to deliver us the best success right now? Because that's hopefully the magic are going to be in contention for the play and maybe even like one of the one of the top six places. Um, I think that would be a stretch this year, but you never know. Um, because the East's got a habit of bottoming out every so often, you know. Uh, but I, that's that's the thing for me. And Suggs is such a big um, what if because if he if he can make the leap, then I think based on his defense and the defensive culture and identity. And look look at the two teams in the finals, right? That's two teams that got there because of their defense, you know, um, especially Boston. Like that that was their their calling card, and the NBA being the NBA, there are players that can have that magic, even the very best defence, good offence beats good defence. And that's what I want to see from the magic. I want to see signs that we've got that kind of player. Like we've got we've got the players that can be that good offence, beating good defence, because I think we will have good defence. I think we've we've drafted um well and we've built a team well to do that. And I think Jamal Mosley's got them playing in a way that that will be what we hang our hat on every night. Um, and yeah, I think that's something I would actually be be interested to to really monitor next season is the Magic's defensive rating, how it's trending, because obviously we saw um, it was after January. I think we'd, we'd yeah we'd top the best. ten after January. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's going to be that's going to be a big thing for us next season is looking at how that's trending as the year goes, uh, and. I think if Jonathan Isaac stays healthy, I mean, that's without Jonathan Isaac, who is, yeah. I think, the best defensive player in the league when fit, like definitely potentially. And the way he can guard one through five, his footwork, um, I think him and Robert Williams of the Celtics are the best two defensive players in the league for all that Marcus Smart won the award. And I think deservedly so, and it was great to see a guard win it. Um yeah, I, I think I think those two guys can do things that nobody else can do with their height and their length and the fact they can move their feet. And um, Isaac, the difference with Isaac is he can guard even further out because I think Williams relies on being the, the guy coming for the weak side, you know? Um, mm. Whereas I think Isaac can be the on-ball defender and keep people in front of him. So he's, he's, he's a difference maker for the get-go. Um, just pray that he stays healthy because if he can be... If he can be a guy that can can give like the magic eight good years, even then we do have a chance of getting that championship. 
Do you know what though? There's several things to love about this roster, regardless of who we draft on Thursday next week. This roster, if you look at the guard position, if you look at the forwards and the bigs, there's so much versatility. Like you can make an argument for Kel and Cole starting together. You can make an argument yeah. for for Sug starting with with Kel as well in the backcourt and Wendell and Chet or Wendell and Jabari. J.I. can play the five position for stretches and you could plug him next to Jabari if he's the guy. There's so much there's so much there. And, and me and Gary have talked about this before that let's say we make the play-in tournament. A lot's got to go right for us this season for us to get to that pos- to get into that position. And it's going to take a team effort. But there's so many players on this roster as well that have got that big game in them as well. Like we've seen Markel had big games. Suggs has had them this year. Wendell's had a couple of big offensive games. Franz. There's a lot to like about this team. Um, it's going to be really interesting. I, I'm a big J.I. fan. I really have been. Um, oh. And I agree, Hodgie. Like, he's a Defensive Player of the Year candidate when healthy. Um we just so there's got, no we just, defender in the league, Mike. He can do what he does. There's no, not. there's not. No, there's not. There's not. And we'll, we'll go into this in a second, but that's why I would pick Jabari Smith on Thursday because yeah. he's he's got the ability to defend multiple positions where I'm not sure Chet can out on the perimeter. We've seen him sort of get bullied a little bit. I'm not sure his footwork is, is quite as good as Jabari locking down players like that. Um, like To me, Jabari's a better fit now and I think he's got the upside. I, I don't, and like our good friend Philip Rossman Reich, I heard him say this this week because we had him on the pod a few weeks ago. Um, and he said, Chet has limits, obviously, physically being the main one. Jabari doesn't have any. His, his only real limits are things like, can he handle the ball? Can he get to the bar? Can he finish around the basket better? But that's things he can work on with repetition. Whereas Chet physically can only get so far. Paolo, can he can he develop that side defensively? I'm not so sure he's he he can. Mm-hmm. Um and I just feel like Jabari's got that Chet ceiling's the highest out of all three. But if you take the physicality point of view, I, I think Jabari is the best two-way player out of the three of all of them. And and if you look at Jason Tatum as one of the one of the key players for the Celtics getting to the finals this year, his ability to play on both ends. And you, and you look at both teams, like you talk about defensively, they're, they're all versatile. They're all good on both ends of the floor. Um, I, I think our biggest thing this year, regardless of who we pick, if we can improve our three-point shooting and that ability to spread the floor, I think that's going to be our biggest strength this, or, or, or certainly going to elevate our, our, our game this year. Um, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting debate for the rest of the summer, but yeah, like if you, if you think of like, I would personally start Suggs, like you don't draft a guy five and, and bring him off the bench as much as you love Cole Suggs and Fultz's ability to get down, downhill and get to the court uh, and get to the hoop. And you've got players like Jabari out on the three point line of Franz can improve his his uh, efficiency from from beyond the arc as well. There's so much there's so much there to like about this team. I'm I'm excited. I don't care. Yeah, who you draft, I, I, but, um... I'm excited as well. <laughs> On the Jabari point, like an interesting thing there is, you if you move him to the three, then that gives you a chance to play lineups with Point Franz as well. So yeah. that's what Mikey. Why did you do this? <laughs> I like, changed your mind. And, no, then, you can, a, and then you and then you can I'm, play I'm, and then you can be. Then you could play big lineups of Jabari, J.I. and Wendell out there. Do you know what I mean? Like That's, that, that, that's, the, see, I that's, mean, that's the versatility, isn't it? That's the well, versatility I, I think, this I think, got. I think your point on two-way is, is a big one, right? But to use the Jason Tatum comparison, because it's just such a fascinating debate, this, right? Chet can be that player that I think upside-wise that puts you over the top. And... If you look at, like, I mean, I'm looking at this through the prism of what wins you a championship, right? Which mm. I know, like, anyone who's not a Magic fan that's listening to this will be like, oh, yeah, very good, mate. Right? <laughs> um, but, yeah, ch- championship by 2030, Alex Martins, right? Okay. 
Um, what wins you a championship is a player like Chet having maximised his upside, right? You mentioned Jason Tatum. The reason that the Boston Celtics have not won the championship this year, other than Stephen Curry's magic and the Warriors culture and all the stuff that I've been writing about, um, is that Tatum wasn't wasn't able to be that guy for the Boston yeah. Celtics this year. Now, can Jabari be that guy at some point in the future, the guy that leads a championship team? That's the that's the question, I think, with the number one pick that you've got to ask. If you believe that you can, then I think you do that. But if you're drafting to kind of... I think with the number one pick, the, the big difference with that is... Um, and this is why the Magic might trade down, to come back to a point you made earlier, Gary, is if you think that Chet Holmgren is going to be someone that you're going to have to adapt things about the team around and it deviates too much from your existing plan, then you go Jabari. Um, but the, the other thing is we don't know what other teams are going to want to do and who they're going to take. The Magic are going to need to be rock solid certain on who someone is taking to trade that pick away. Yeah. You know, it's, I think, by the way, like looking at this, taking the Orlando Magic hat off, is the most intriguing draft for a while because you get no idea what's happening with that top five. Absolutely yeah. none. Part of that is the front office is being stum. And I love that tweet the Magic put out about, um, like, we've got a type, you know? And, like, the thing is, you could say that that type was either Chet or Jabari. I kind of took it as Chet at the time, and now I'm thinking about it, and I'm like, hmm, that's, <laughs> that's still ambiguous, you know? Um but yeah, like I, I think this could be. We could see anything happen with that top five. We could see the magic trade down and and take Jabari. I mean, we're not trading out the top two, but we might trade the top pick away if we thought we were getting something decent in return. But I don't think that'll be the uh, like the the Rockets like list of stuff. I think what we would do is we would we would go for like if we get three future first rounders. Like we're a team that's that's not going to be like sort of competing for championships in that window unless they take a huge jump, then maybe the magic do do it. Trend the Lakers, are we? <laughs> <laughs> I like it. So, so who, who are we all picking? So, moment sticking stew with Chet, uh, Mikey's Jabari, yeah. Gary. Who are you? Who are you picking, mate? I'll be honest, I'm trading the pick. Like, okay. For, like, so I, I, if, that deal, if that deal was on the table and it was... For Russell deal, Westbrook? Uh, yep, Russell Westbrook. <laughs> Only if you threw in Taylor and Horton Tucker, though, because I want to <laughs> I, My concern is, is that we sat here in the week, like a week before the draft, and we, we, we can't get that consensus and I'm going backwards and forwards, and I've gone backwards and forwards that many times that I'm kind of okay with any of those three. Whoever the magic pick, I'm fine with because I trust. So you'd them. take Paolo, yeah? Yeah, I'd, I'd have a go at him. I think my only my worry with Bancaro, I know a lot of people saying about defense, but I think that's a Duke thing. I think that's like mm-hmm. the way, I think possibly they've become outdated, and the coach plays a system that doesn't quite fit current basketball now. <clears throat> We've got a guy who's been asked to do two ends of the floor and he can't because everything kind of went, you know, like expend yourself on the offensive end and wore him out where it was this like chase around um, style defence that might not have suited him. My worry with Bancaro would more be if we took him, could him and Wendell play together? Because I yeah. see an overlap. Yeah, no, I'm with you there. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's my worry. Um, if it was a deal that was on the table, because I'm, I'm positive OKC won't move up. I think OKC are fine to take Chet or Jabari. That, that's I where I'm at with OKC. Yeah, I'm with so you. If it was a one where it's like, will you take Bancaro because we love him in Houston and they fell into that, I would then be all right with picking who was left at third whilst taking whatever off Houston and flipping around. If you put a, a gun to my head now and said, you have to use the top pick, I've been there so long with Chet, I don't see the point of really moving now. But I'm kind of at that phase where it doesn't really matter. Um, I, I would be really interested when we're talking lineups before 
if we did take uh, Chet or Jabari to see one of Jalen Suggs, Franz Wagner, um, let's say Jabari Smith, uh, Jonathan Isaac, and Wendell Carter lineup look like because I think we could just win every game one nil. <laughs> <laughs> That would work for me. But yeah, it's it's interesting. The Jabari one's interesting because if he is Jason Tatum or he can get anywhere near to that, you could make a comparison between Suggs and Smart and say, well, you've got two of Boston's big three that's just put them on a finals run. That that could be the argument if you really do believe that Jabari can be Tatum. I'm not totally convinced by that. Okay. Well, see, I've got a, I've got a kind of, I, I look at Boston more as a, 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 a like a, an almost big four, like, and and that's not devaluing the contribution of Al Horford this year, mm. but um, he he's a veteran. If you look at the curve that the rest of them are on, I think Robert Williams will be one of their best three players uh, next year. I think Jalen Brown was a lot more consistent than Tatum this year. But I think what you see is you see that you need that one. You need that one. And Jason Tatum's been fantastic all season. But in the playoffs, his form dipped and there was it was a bit of a roller coaster ride. And in the finals, he just didn't deliver. He didn't deliver a signature Jason Tatum performance. But and, he was and, struggling with an with an injury, wasn't he? Didn't he have a yeah. that he was sort of trying to shake off? I'm not quite sure, but I, I mean, it was like it's obviously very suitable to say that after the event, like <laughs> yes, after, you, after you've not and really I think, delivered. I, th- I think this was early. I think this was after about game two or game three. This was coming out, but I thought my, my, my view. He, he, he was thing, certainly disappointing. He was certainly disappointing. Yeah, mm, yeah. But I mean, if you look at Robert Williams, on the other hand, I think he came out of the finals gleaming. And he's been yeah. nursing an injury a lot longer. Although, again, you don't need him to be that one. So, yeah, there's, I mean, there's different ways of looking at any situation. But who, who can be that one for the Magic? I think Chet Holmgren can be that one. And as much as I kind of thought you made some good points there, Gary, I don't think the Magic, the Magic have, tr- like, the, the times we've had number one picks, it's got us to the finals. Right? And we've we've gone for a big Right, I mean, Chet Holmgren says he's not a centre. Some lists do, right? The Magic getting a centre or going for the big, like the the best big in the draft at number one. That's tradition. Let's do it again. I think um, we've when you were saying about Horford there, we've already got young Horford though, haven't we? <laughs> that's true. Yeah. So it, it's it's yeah. interesting. I, I don't know. That's where I, I I would go, Chet. To to bring that back, I would go with Chet. But um, I was saying to G earlier when when there was the Dwight Howard Emigo Oga for draft before where there wasn't a consensus one, I'd kind of firmly planted myself in the Dwight camp by this stage, and I've kind of got like a foot in the Chet camp, and then I've got to go keep on going between Javari and Paolo and the other one. So <laughs> that's why if we traded the pick, and as long as it was top three, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be hurt. Yeah. So we got two for Chet then. Um... And I will tell you that I'm with Mikey and I would go Jabari for all the reasons Mikey said. So I'm not even going to repeat them just because you've just, we've just gone all over it. Um, but yeah, Jabari for me. But that could change by Thursday. So We need we a tiebreaker. Do you know where Paul's at? Uh, Paul, what did he say last Paul, week? Paul, Paul always turns around and he goes, I haven't watched enough film yet. <laughs> he just plays the old... Uh... <laughs> Paul's last one though. I don't think Paul's I think Paul's more Jabari Paul's not sure he's more Jabari than Paolo from yeah mm. it's going to be really interesting this week because like, there's been a bit of a lull on Twitter this week there? there's not really much really to speculate or talk about it's all rumours about well Chet's not submitting his medical records and all this other stuff and then the next minute he's wearing magic shorts and everyone's like he's going he's to be a magic player and it's just like everyone's just hanging their hats on like the smallest little bit of information they can get hold of but it's the the chatter and the talk on on Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday this week's going to really ramp up it's going to be it's going to be interesting. It's going to be a lot of fun. I I don't think there's going to be any trades that go down at all because no. I think I think if you ask all three teams, Houston, OKC, and us, I think really hand on heart, they'd probably be happy with any three of those top players. 
in any order, really, if, if it fell to them. I mean, we've that, got the that, big decision, haven't we, of who's the guy. But if you ask the other two, are they really going to have, are, are they really set on a guy where they're, they're going to go all out to go and get them? I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, because I think OKC will probably be back in this position next year where they'll be after, is it Wemby Armour? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, what a player, man. So if they miss out on Chet, are they, are they really going to go, well, we might have a chance at him next year? I don't know. I have no idea. But they've they got to go careful, OKC. They need to uh, they need to turn things around before Shea decides he's got, had enough in OKC as well. So... <laughs> Well, aye, that's that, that, that's you know the big mean? thing for them. They they need to they need to make sure that they don't just fall into because I think it's really good stocking up and draft picks um, the way that they have. But there there comes a point that when you've you've got someone who can can be that guy and he's he's shown signs, you know, like the, then they've got to do that. I think the one thing that I would say, and this is hopefully I, I, I so hope I'm not jinxing anything or tempting fate or whatever but I trust this front office I trust them I yeah. trust them to get the decision right mm-hmm. and I mean having been through Rob Hennigan and all of that stuff that was attached to that it's good to be in that position where I'm going into it with confidence everyone that in, in the magic sort of fandom arena is unsure and wavering and all of us have misgivings and and positive one minute and then we're thinking, oh, but is that right? I trust them to get this right. And it's like, it's a huge call because I can't remember, I mean, what was the last draft where there was as much uncertainty over who the top pick would be? Like, um, or, or at least like a kind of clear top three that were clear of the rest. And then... I'm, I'm I guess so you go back to the Aiton Aiton draft where Doncic went three, Trey Truth. Young went five, Bagley. Who else? But was it, it was quite sure that the Suns were going to go for Aiton. Aiton, like, like that. That seemed that seemed quite locked in, even going into that. But I mean, going into that draft, I did say I don't know what they're playing at. Go for Luka Doncic. Right, like, yeah. and I mean, I, I couldn't understand that. I think that was just the the hangover of sort of European players past, like you know. But I think that trust is there. I think after Luca now, it doesn't it doesn't really matter. There's there's so many interesting players in the draft. Nikola Jovic is another one. Um, mm. or Jovic, I'm not sure if it's Jovic or Jovic, like the the Real Madrid uh, striker or or Jokic Jovic. Um, but yeah, I mean, he he's another fascinating player. There's there's players all down this draft um, that that could end up being decent. But I think the other fascinating thing is l- looking ahead to next year's draft class. That's going to be that that's going to be a special one, I think. Um, so I like but the magic are in a good place. It's like it's like the old cliche. It's a good problem to have to be in this position, you know. Absolutely. They already know. Definitely. They already yeah. know. They already know. And it's, so and it's, then. And I, and I agree I agree with Hodgie, sorry, just to say that I completely trust this front office. Yeah. And then watch us yeah. go and uh, draft Jaden Ivy number one. <laughs> <laughs> Sharp. <laughs> yeah. So then, guys, um, a little bit of light relief. Do you want a, a little magic trivia? I've got okay. a uh, Who Am I? Couple of couple of uh, clues. Obviously, these guys have played for the Magic at some point. I've got three. You can uh, you can all have a go at the same time. I'll start off with the easiest one. Okay. So you ready? This is where okay. I show myself to be a clueless journalist. By the way. <laughs> <laughs> so this first player was born on October the third, nineteen ninety-seven. No, I'll move on to the second one. He averaged 5.4 points, 3.7 rebounds in his rookie year. Again, not much to go on. You might get after this one. Uh, he played for the Florida State Seminoles. Hi. Jonathan Isaac is correct. Uh, the, the remaining clues were drafted six by the Magic in 2017, and he wears number one. So, well done. Right, we'll kick it up a notch. Okay, 
A game show. Next player. I, I, lo- do you know what? I, I love the amount of pizzazz you're doing this week. We're going to Ryan Stuckett for this, Jay. <laughs> Yeah, it's just a shame I can't do the Chris Tarrant uh, impersonations like Stuart can, isn't it? There we go. Uh, I'm not going to try again. I think it was a one-off that I managed to just about get right, so I'm not going to ruin it by trying it again. <laughs> it was very good, mate. It was very good. Um, okay, second one. Um, born April 30th, 1985. He attended LSU. Shaq? Mm-hmm. No, no. Not, no, no, not no, no, quite. No. No, okay. He had been seven. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he was drafted by the New Orleans Hornets, 33rd overall in 2005. His career in the NBA spanned between 2005 and 2017. He wore the number... Th- Sorry, was that... Spates. Anybody there? Spates? No. Spates. He was he was a gator. He was a Florida gator. Well, oh, that's right. I yeah. Know. Yeah. Um, he wore number 30 for the Orlando Magic. A Royal wore 30. I you know that. Mm. It wasn't him. I think he went to like Florida International yeah, or, or, or something like that. Um, he played for the Magic between 2009 and 2011. Brandon Bass. Yeah. Brandon Bass is nice spot moment. on. And the, and the last clue would have been, I was traded away for Glenn, Big Baby Davis, Mikey Clark's favourite player. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know the story, Stu, of Mikey buying a, a Big Baby D- um, Davis uh, jersey? Uh, I think it's worth telling. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> it's not. I, I don't. It's not in my possession anymore. I sold it on eBay for about twenty quid. I can't believe I got twenty quid for it. I was going to say, like, <laughs> who rocked up and paid that? To be fair, right? To, to be fair, I think it was twenty thirteen. So it was like the third. Yeah, it was twenty. It was the twenty twelve thirteen season. So it was the first year of Rob Hennigan's rebuild. And you can't go to a Magic game without buying a new jersey. And I'm looking at the roster and I'm like, who the hell am I going to buy a jersey off that's of any <laughs> relevance except like Andrew Nichols? No, I don't. I think it was the following year we drafted Andrew Nicholson. Well, that season I bought a Mo Harkless jersey, so that's probably as bad as buying a big there you baby. Go. So I was like, well, big baby. Everyone knows who he is. So, uh, and I, I already had Turkaloo and JJ and Jameer. So I was like, let's, uh, let's rock a, a big baby jersey for a year. <laughs> right then, last one. I probably think this one's maybe the hardest one. Um, born August 23rd, 1976. You're not going to get it off that. He went to Notre Dame. Pat Garrity. Oh my God, he's good, isn't he? He's ah, good. Ah. I shouldn't have chucked that in because the next one was selected by the Bucks 19th overall in 1998. Played in the league between 98 and 2008. He only played for two teams and that was the Suns and the Magic and the last uh, clue was he was traded to the Magic for Anthony Hardaway. Here we go. Hold on, guys. He's really good at these, Gary. Oh, my, I don't so, know. It's well. magnificent. I'm, I'm just like, I'm fuel up. <laughs> <laughs> there we go so um, as we've mentioned earlier don't forget to sign up for the draft watch party if you haven't done so already uh, Stuart thank you ever so much for joining us I uh, appreciate you giving it up your, your time this evening um, do you want to do a, a quick plug your socials for the listeners Aye, sorry for the long rambling answers by the way I'm just excited about the draft and like I'm basically working through everything in my own head as I say it and then thinking I'm like, am I talking nonsense or I'm actually making sense and then Mikey throws in grenades to my opinion <laughs> like ahead of draft night by the way I'm coming to the draft watch party guys I look forward Good. to it um, and sorry if I get distracted oh, midway through there was a bit of breaking news there that um, Kenny Atkinson's staying with the Warriors and not taking the Hornets job Ooh. which is, is quite interesting for obviously divisionally whatever um, but yeah my socials you'll find are Hodgy the Hack H-O-D-G-E-Y the Hack all one word um, you can find me on Instagram 
uh, Twitter. Well, I said that like Instagram. That's the least important one. Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. <laughs> and I would obviously be really grateful um, if anybody follows me after this on Twitter, send me a wee message, say hello, and on YouTube, um, if you subscribe to that, then I will be I will be firing out lots of content. But it'll probably be after the summer is out the way. Um, I've written my draft pieces and then go on with my career. Awesome. Good stuff. Um, so thanks to everybody, as always, for listening, watching. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter, all at Orlando Magic UK. Uh, so from Gary, Mikey, Stu, and myself, until next week, go Magic.